Good morning. How are you all? Good? Hi. My name is Jean Andre. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Environment, and it's my great honor to be able to moderate the, the morning session here with you. As you know, this is the United or the University of Waterloo's World Water Day event. And of course, it's also connected with world water events all around this great globe of ours. I want to begin by acknowledging that we live and work on the traditional territory of the neutral, the Anishinaabe, and the Haudenosaunee people. The University of Waterloo is situated on the Haldeman Tract, and this is land that was promised to the Six Nations that includes 10 kilometers on either side of the Grand River. We're truly grateful to be able to gather here on these traditional lands. Now, the World Water Day is an international day to celebrate fresh water, something that, the, that, 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 that was recommended at the 1992 United Nations Conference on Environment and Development in Rio de Janeiro. And it was adopted by the United Nations Assembly on the 22nd of March of 1993. So now, more than two decades later, we continue to gather to celebrate. And so in order to begin to celebrate um, together, I'm asking uh, Elder Lila Briere to please come and offer an opening prayer. Where's, our, where's, our, where's Lila? Here we go. Thank you. Thank you, Elder Lila. Bonjour. Ne me tuen ke noi koe de shinkaz makwato tan. Kuch ching dun chiba. It's an honor to be here this morning. <laughs> this is the first time I'm doing this, and uh, it's a great honor. And. Uh, the first thing that I said to myself when I, when I was asked to do this prayer, I thought, I've never done this before. <laughs> Am I really an elder? <laughs> and I, uh, I listened to Josephine, and one thing that she said was, uh, she said, if you, want, if you want to do something, do it anyway. And uh, I had the opportunity of meeting her. She was such a gentle spirit. So I'd like to honor the water today and to to think about Josephine and and I think of all the the energy that she uh, she put into the walk. I can't even imagine. Like I listened to some of the struggles that she went through. And I think about that water and how much it meant to her. And I think we need to have a look at what the water really means to us as human beings. And I've learned to respect that myself because it's so easy to take advantage of that. We get up every morning and some of us, the first thing we do is, have, is drink that water. And one day we might turn that tap on and it, and it would be all dirty. But I ask our creator today to, to thank him for bringing us together, that we could learn, learn from each other, and that we could learn respect, and that mother is just suffering right now. And there are times that I, I cry for her because I see what's happening. I want to share a story with you, and uh, I'm originally from, uh, not originally, I'm, I'm originally from up north near Thunder Bay, but uh, up there there's still clear water, and um, I, live in, lived in, I live in Sarnia, that's where I'm residing right now, and the water there is majorly sick, <clears throat> and I remember my partner and I were walking along the river, the riverfront. This was about 11 o'clock at night, and this guy was out there fishing. And he yelled at us, and he said, hey, he said, uh, I got my limit. You guys want some fish? So my partner got all excited, and he said, yeah, sure. Yeah. 
And right away I said, I'm not eating that. Uh, so we took it. We took it to the house anyway. He cleaned it, and and I cooked it. And I could just see the oil on top the, on top the grease. The oil from, you know, from the ships that go by. And I went, wow. And that was new to me, because I had just moved into the area. And I started to see on the ground, all the pipelines that were underneath the ground. And I asked my partner, I said, where am I anyway? Because I had never seen that before. So I seen what was happening to, to Mother Earth. And I thought, wow. I would, I would look at everything every day, like, you know, the air was different to me, the water was different to me. Everything was so different. And I lived there for seven years. You know, working at, at an agency down there. And then it became my home. So I know I'm here for a reason, you know, and I'm, I'm here to learn. And I know that uh, I, I feel that suffering that's going on. I seen a picture one time of uh, somebody drew of Mother Earth, and her hair was long and beautiful. But on, on top of her hair was garbage. And, plastic bottles and you know and the and the water beside her was dirty. And I said to the person that drew it, I said, you need to share that picture with other people. Because sometimes people can't see. So we all need to pull together and do our part. And that's what I'm asking Creator today, is that we open our eyes and that we learn from each other. You know, that we take we take responsibility for our for our water. It's not only an indigenous problems, everybody's. It's going to affect all of us. So I just want to say my good to creative. I ask the spirits to be here today to teach us what we need to learn and to bring us together as one. My good. And, and now we will. And now I'm going to ask the Indigenous Student Association to lead us in a song. Um, Elder Lila, I don't know if you want to join the, the students. Yeah, that would be great. And you might want to tell us a little bit about the song as well. Yeah, thank you. Hello, everyone. So today we're going to sing a song called Nibi, and uh, it's written by Doreen Day. And the song, what, it's sing, what we're saying is, uh, Water, we love you, we thank you, and we respect you. So we're going to come a little bit closer together, I think, because it's a song where, um, yeah. So we'll just get started. Do you want to play this a little? Just so that we're, OK. Nibi. Gizage go Gizage 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for entering into that spirit that we share in terms of protecting our earth. And I would like now just to, um, to give Elder Lila a small gift on, on behalf of the University of Waterloo. So many of you know that International um, Water Day has been celebrated for many years. And many of you also know that um, there's still many challenges ahead of us. Just to provide a, a, a very brief sort of context, many, in 2015, the world came together, 193 countries, to um, endorse and, and commit to meeting the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And goal number six basically commits us by 2030 to provide clean, accessible water and appropriate sanitation to all peoples of the earth. But we know that now, still, about 29% of the people who live on this globe do not have access to clean water. And we know that in Canada, that also is true, that many people do not have access. And many of those who do not have access live on, on our indigenous uh, reserves and in other parts of the north. And so today is really a chance for us to explore Sustainable Development Goal 6 here at home, in Canada, in places and in ways where we need to step up if we're going to achieve this goal by 2030. And so it's my great honor to host this, uh, this panel of, of people who are going to share their perspectives. I'll, each, I'll introduce each in turn. Each of them will make some brief remarks. Then there will be an opportunity where we can have an exchange of questions. Um, so as you're listening, please think of some things that you would like to ask our panelists. And um, hopefully we'll all leave feeling both um, invigorated in terms of being able to make a difference, but also deeply committed to doing the same. So our first speaker today is going to be Lydia Whitson, who's the Cowichan Nation from British Columbia. Uh, she's the principal there with, a, with her Quitson con consulting for, firm, and she's a uh, on the board of governors for Royal Roads University. So welcome very much, Lydia. Thank you. See you, see you, respected ones. Hi, Tsev, Kat, the neutral, Anishnabek, Harishoni, Mastimuk, at the Sash, Tamuk, Iatai, acknowledging the people of this territory for still opening the way for us to be here. The Equin is the almost talk. I'm so pleased that we're able to gather uh, together. My name is, uh, my traditional name through ceremony is Lilia. That name belonged to my grandmother, and that's how we connect and remember the generations before us in terms of our um, ongoing place in the world. I'm part of the Cowichan tribes. I live in the Quamichan village, the same village I was born in, in my grandmother's house. My mom didn't believe in going to doctors then because they treated indigenous people so badly. So she had us all, all her kids at home. So I just want to take a moment to be thankful for, for the prayer, um, for the ceremony, for the elder, for the song that all helps us get ready to have our open minds and open hearts to understand that whichever perspective we're coming from, we have a commitment and a need and a respective um, need for water. So if we can find nothing similar between us all, we can at least find that. I was using my big house voice there. <laughs> Now I got, got my, uh, my talking sick. So um, <laughs> that's the way the elders talk about it at home. Um, so I'm thankful for the water sustainability and the water that sustains us in our heart, our spirit, our mind, and our body. There's a framework around water, that one that we can't, uh, um, no matter how, what your perspective, that we can't ignore. We are reliant for our sustainability on water. So today, I'm thankful to have the opportunity here. I'm um, 
spent many years as a chief of my community in Cowichan, um, have done significant advocacy work with respect to uh, not only our unextinguished Aboriginal rights and title, but also um, in terms of supporting a, a framework, a governance framework that actually takes Indigenous voice, Indigenous process, and Indigenous values into play in the, the, the governance framework. So I know I have a very limited amount of time, so I'm just going to touch on uh, a few things in terms of the, some of the work that I've been doing. Um, and I was saying to the, to the other respected panelists when we're walking in, I'll try to sum up like 20 years worth of work in about 90 seconds. And so uh, we'll try and just keep, I want to flag a few examples and then turn to the other, other panelists. So largely from a, an advocate perspective, um, this experience in working towards a governance model that recognizes uh, Indigenous people's authority. Not a, a delegated, you have the right to be consulted as a stakeholder or otherwise, but the fact that we have, in British Columbia, we don't, we're still in the process of negotiating treaties. Cowichan is not a treaty. We've never entered into treaty. So what we do is we stand on our unextinguished Aboriginal rights and title as a legitimate source of authority in the context of engaging with government. So one example I'll use is we've done um, work in the Cowichan Valley, which is part of the uh, traditional territory of the Cowichan tribes, to uh, support the development of local decision making. So we, without any, about a decade ago, without any real um, legislative framework or um, from outside, we used our inherent rights and title, framed up. Uh, and a, a governance approach with local government, engaging with them. Because often Indigenous people would say, I don't want to engage with local government. And they're like, they don't have authority like we do. So the fundamental thing was, let's come to the table and make very clear that we're coming to the table with our unextinguished rights and title, but we also have a, a, a common need for the sustainability of our water. So the interesting aspect from a governance perspective in creating the Cowichan Watershed Board in uh, the Cowichan Valley was to bring local government to the table, so all the mayors and, and uh, uh, Reeves and regional representatives, along with the Cowichan Tribes Chief and Council and this Cowichan Watershed Board that we created, to start leveraging ways of strategically bringing local decision making, local impact, First Nations values and perspectives to the table when we're talking about managing water, but also talking about tapping into uh, the provincial government who asserts their interest under Section 91 of the Canadian Constitution saying that they have this authority. Well, we assert our right under Section 35 in terms of our unextinguished rights and title. And as long as we can come to the table with our recognized authority, change the dynamics of the discussion. We're not looking to have some delegated authority. We're coming with our authority and looking for a mutual engagement where um, in the Cowichan Valley, we're, we're all reliant on the watershed in terms of our sustainability, so we find um, an opportunity to work together. The, we've done a, just finished 18 months of work with local government to commit, for getting them to commit and endorse a, a statement that I worked with the elders on to, in our language, recognizing an, our unextinguished rights and title. We came to the table saying we're not going to be able to agree on everything, so we brought a principle to the table from our people. It's an ancient principle called Natsamat which is an ancient principle that talks about how we work together. I won't go into it. I've workshopped people for days on this process, but it's an it's this ancient principle that talks about how we can come together. And so when you come together, you have to be very realistic. So in this case, when we're coming together, it was natsama kusiai staka. We'll come together to work for the sake of our water. We might disagree on many things, but when it comes to our water, we're making a commitment to work together. But in the context of the recognition of our unextinguished rights and title, very important, the recognition of the authority we bring to the table. It's not Indian Act authority. It's not delegated provincial or federal authority. It's our existing authority. So the Couch and Watershed Board is just one example where we bring our language, our principles to bear in the context of the larger, um, the work that's being done in the couch and valley. Am I doing okay for time? Yeah. The, uh, I'll just, trying to, I start trying to talk quick when I think, 
the elders would always say, slow down. <laughs> and I'm like, but you know, there's so many things we could do. Anyway, um, <laughs> the, uh, so another example I'll bring forward just briefly is that we've been, uh, the, um, in British Columbia, the Water Act was like just over 100 years old when they went to amend it. It, 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 coincidentally perhaps, in 2015, under the former Liberal provincial government, they amended the 100-year-old Water Act, but even in 2015, neglected to recognize the existence of Indigenous people's unextinguished rights and title. So we're, we're working with them, again, coming not like we did with local government, saying we bring our authority, and the same with uh, working with the, um, the provincial government in British Columbia, recognizing that we'll engage, but we have to engage in the understanding that we're bringing our authority to the table. We're not coming to look for authority or some delegated Indian Act kind of model that assumes the decision making rests with people uh, um, outside of the nation. So that was an interesting opportunity in, in British Columbia to look at the, uh, um, through the Minister of, uh, BC Minister of Climate, uh, Environment and Climate Change in British Columbia assembled a, um, a very diverse committee that he asked me to co-chair uh, with the objective of coming out with a set of recommendations to amend the BC Environmental Assessment Act to actually bring in to that process more, one, recognition. I came to, I said, I'll chair, but we've got to start from recognition. If we start from denial, we're, how long is it going to take to get to solution? So as long as, and we did this work, we met for over 100 hours with this committee, and then in November, the Environmental Assessment Act in British Columbia was changed. And now we're going into a process of implementation where we're bringing Indigenous people to the table to, to help make that happen. The objective, the, one of the main reasons I accepted it is because the minister said they wanted to incorporate the UN, the principles of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People into British Columbia law. And I said, yeah, I'd like to be part of that because it's so key and important. Um, a lot of that was around um, aggregated impacts on water, right? When the, in the Assessment Act had all these little pieces and everybody did met their little appropriate requirements, but there was no aggregate of the impact on water. And that was one of the key um, gaps in terms of that, uh, that legislation and, and many others. But um, that drive to say, okay, well, let's get a little more holistic view. Let's incorporate the principles of UNDRIP with respect to recognition, the right to make decisions, the, the unextinguished um, right and title of Indigenous people to bring their voice forward, not to be a delegated voice or otherwise um, subject to some uh, delegated authority. So there was, we've, there's been lots of work over the years in our territory where, um, I take one more minute just to talk about uh, the treaty negotiation process in British Columbia. It was just since the 90s, they engaged in a tripartite treaty negotiation process in British Columbia that First Nations have had the opportunity to engage in. And um, one of the aspects of the treaty process is you could do interim measures, and uh, which makes a lot of sense. And I was at chief at the time, and I was like, oh, I want to do an interim measure to protect this culturally significant area. No, 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 no. You're not in stage four yet. You can't do that. I'm like, show me where it says we can't protect our culturally significant land. So we pushed and pushed, and even in that context, we're able to protect. And the provincial, NDP provincial government was going out just before the Liberals, so they were anxious. They, they legislative, re, legislatively removed all the encumbrances on 1,700 hectares of land that our people were still using for spiritual purposes, mainly because of the quality of water there. So I won't take up any more time. There's so much the, um, work to be done. I'm thankful for the presence of everybody in this room and those that have convened this work and uh, look forward to uh, um, the discussion going forward. In my community, you lift up your hands to to thank you. So I lift my hands up to you all and thank you for your presence today. Thank you. Thank you, Lydia, for reminding us about authority as you've expressed. I think it's so important. Our second speaker is Kathleen Padulo, and she is from the Oneida uh, Nation of the Thames, and she is the Director of Environment for the Chiefs of Ontario. So welcome to the panel. Uh, thank you, and um, good morning, everyone. Saguli. Uh, and uh, I first of all want to thank our elder for opening us up in a good way. Thank you very much. And um, I also want to acknowledge the traditional territories that we're on today. I want to thank the Dean and the Faculty of Environment of Waterloo for inviting this panel today on World Water Day. 
Uh, very, very important day today. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge all of the students, youth, um, babies in the room today, um, parents, elders, um, teachers, and um, I especially want to thank the, uh, the youth and the students for the song. Um, and today, I think it is really important uh, to think about, you know, water and how we can, you know, think about leaving no one behind when we're, we think about water. And so um, today, actually, um, I'm not going to be speaking so much from my community. I'll talk a little bit about my community and where it's located, but more about some of the work that I do at the Chiefs of Ontario. So um, I am from the Oneida Nation of the Thames, which is one of the six Haudenosaunee communities. Oneida uh, is located outside of London, Ontario, uh, about 20 minutes west. And um, we also have Oneida um, on the state side. Um, so for my home community, Oneida Nation of the Thames, uh, we, we do have impacts to, you know, um, our source water. Uh, we have impacts um, because we're right beside the largest landfill in Canada. All of Toronto's waste goes to Green Lane Landfill which is less than two kilometers from Oneida Nation of the Thames. But we're also impacted downstream um, from the city of London, Ontario itself. And so, um, you know, when you, you think about um, World Water Day and we think about our responsibilities um, as human beings, but our responsibilities um, also to our families and to our children and the future generations, um, we have to think about uh, where our water com comes from and how to protect that source. And so um, in my work at the Chiefs of Ontario, um, in the environment sector, uh, you know, my responsibilities uh, come from 133 chiefs who are my bosses. And, uh, and my, the mandates come through resolutions. And so a lot of that work is looking at protecting that water. And so um, I know this morning when they started with that song, um, it reminded me of Josephine Mandamon. And um, the Chiefs of Ontario back in 2008 um, drafted um, a water declaration. And I know some of you may have seen this water declaration, but you know, Josephine was one of those, um, uh, Grandmother Josephine was, was behind a lot of this work um, that drove protecting the water, that drove that advocacy um, that many of us have today. And so I just want to acknowledge all of Josephine's hard work today on International Water Day. Um, but, you know, the water declaration um, came about in 2008 from ceremony. Uh, and, but it um, was prompted from a lot of policy that was driven provincially and federally. And I know our first speaker spoke a lot about, you know, how policy is driven and how it impacts um, our, our lands and our culture. And, um, and for me, you know, um, today, thinking about World Water Day and thinking about this water declaration, it, the water declaration speaks to Indigenous responsibilities and care, taking care of the water and taking care of um, ensuring that we pass on those teachings and, and uh, those responsibilities. And so it's really important to acknowledge that today. Uh, some of the other work that I'm involved with, um, we, I do a lot of work with Deb McGregor, um, who you'll be hearing from shortly. And, uh, and it's great, you know, because um, I think that um, through the work that we've completed um, at the Chiefs of Ontario on the Canada-Ontario Agreement, on the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, I know Deb can attest to this. Um, you know, Indigenous peoples have been fighting for a long time to be included um, as part of these negotiations. Um, we've been on this land for thousands and thousands of years, and so it is really important to acknowledge the Indigenous peoples who are here. And so um, we do a lot of work on the Canada Ontario Agreement, which is coming up for renewal, and, uh, and so we really do hope that Indigenous peoples are acknowledged, um, you know, in the Canada, Ontario, potentially Indigenous Agreement.
So that would be something to strive towards. Um, and also today, I know that the Chiefs of Ontario will be putting out a statement on um, World Water Day. And we're also going to be putting out um, a statement and some of the work that we have done previously with Human Rights Watch. So um, back in 2016, um, when we got our new Liberal government um, back in the House, uh, I went to Geneva with a, um, some women um, to tell their testimony in front of the United Nations rapporteurs to talk about what it's like to grow up with um, unsafe drinking water, um, what it's like to be a caretaker um, and start your day every day with boiling water. So that's what um, this report is about. It's called Make It Safe, Canada's Obligation to End First Nations Water Crisis. And we are talking about a water crisis. So today, um, we still have over 48 First Nation communities in the province of water, or in Ontario, that do not have safe potable drinking water. So they're on a boil water advisory. We have communities that are do not consume. They can't even drink their water. And so there's a lot of um, reasons for that. There's a lot of issues. There's a lot of concern. And so I think today it's also really important to work together to look at what does it really mean, truth and reconciliation? What does it mean when we talk about UNDRIP? Well, I think for me, it means that we all have a responsibility. We all have to work together to ensure that everybody has basic human rights. And some of those basic human rights are safe potable drinking water. And so with that, I'm going to leave it at that. And um, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Kathleen. It, it, um, you, as well as um, Elder Lila, reminded us that it's, it's in our backyard. When you talked about uh, the landfill and you talk about many of these First Nation communities that are close to us without potable drinking water, it brings it very close to home. Our third speaker is, is uh, Dr. Deborah M McGregor who is from the Whitefish uh, uh, River Nation. And uh, she's a professor, associate professor of law and a Canada Research Chair at York University uh, at, the, at Osgoode Hall. And um, I've had a chance to get to know her just a little bit on a project that we've begun to work on together. And it's yes. really exciting to, to bring her to campus here. She has some slides she's going to show us. So. <coughs> Very rarely in a room at a clock. So that actually works. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so I want to thank uh, the students for the, the song this morning. So really nice to, to start the day off like that and the prayer this morning. So that's your first time. So now you know you did a great job. So now you're going to be asked lots more, right? <laughs> so, so that's good. Um, so Ani Bojo, thank you for, for coming this morning. Um, I... Um, yeah, it's really hard to try to jam all this into uh, into a few minutes. And just so you know, being an academic is like being a student, except a bit more intense. So that meant uh, last night I was reading through the questions very carefully and went, "Oh, those are like really big questions to uh, to do introductory remarks." And then I thought, um, even though we were asked to to, to send it uh, to Nancy a couple days ago, if we if we did a presentation to do that, I said, "No, I think people should should see some images. It was just a better way for me to." Uh, convey what I wanted to convey around um, talking about the work that we do and where we come from and in our communities. Um, so I thought, uh, so that's why I did that, just so you know, we still do stuff the last minute sometimes when we're <laughs> academics. Uh, <laughs> so it doesn't change, just so you know. Um, oh, now I can't work. Oh, here we go. So, so one of our, um, our questions was to posi position ourselves. And so I um, So the way I think about the work that I do is to ground it in the community that I'm from. So I call this always the slide, people, places, and knowledge, um, and, my, and my family, like where my obligations lie. So a lot of my obligations lie in terms of who I am, um, and I, I didn't introduce that, I'm a, a Makwa clan, and I'm from uh, Whitefish River First Nation, and I'm an Anishinaabek. So a lot of that drives the work that I do um, and, and where I'm from. So you see the symbol of the Anishinaabek Nation and the clans, and, and I'm the, the bear. Uh, or the the Makwa clan, so so in my community, um, we're 
I don't want to say lucky because it shouldn't be luck. It should be the way it is. Um, our water quality, I guess you could say, is, is pretty good. So when the Ontario First Nations Technical Services Corporation, which is a technical, scientific sort of engineering body that, that uh, tries to address uh, the challenges that First Nations might be facing around water, does their water quality competition, we often win. But that water quality is, is coming from the treatment center, like the public. It's actually not the actual source of the water. So, um, so I'm from um, Manitoulin Island. So there's the, the Great Lakes, the, the, the image from um, space, and McGregor Bay. So literally, I live on McGregor Bay. Um, I'm McGregor on McGregor Bay. So I have certain ob <laughs> obligations there as well. But, but, having the, but the, the public system or the treatment system, which is what the, the government of Canada focuses on in their you know, big announcement in 216, you know, billions of dollars being put into uh, the technical kind of scientific solution to this, doesn't really address the core problem, which is we can't drink the water anymore. Um, which we used to be able to do uh, when I was growing up. So again, these are just more images. So why community surrounded by water? Like every single part of it, actually. So our other name is Birch Island. So we're actually not on the island. We're just we're sort of on a peninsula um, leading out into the uh, into the North Shore. So water is like a really big deal. It was like uh, everything um, for us. This image also conveys some of the, so like Kathleen, I work with Kathleen a lot, so I work at all these different levels. So in my community, we actually did a water security plan for future generations. That came from uh, uh, recommendations as a part, actually from health, not from public works, because the way public works is funded is very technical water treatment plant kind of oriented, not like big community picture around um, how, are we going to, how are we going to secure water for uh, future generations. <clears throat> and in doing this work, uh, I was reminded by people in the community that when we're talking about water, we're not just talking about water like in the glass over there, we're talking about water in all its forms. They said snow and ice, so I went, oh yeah, because actually in the winter is when we could travel better. We tend to think canoeing, but actually where we are anyway, it's actually faster and easier to travel in the winter. You could just go right across the lake as opposed to going around and the water can actually be very dangerous uh, in the summer. Plus we have water beings in the water you have to um, account for as well. So they made me think about um, water security and source water very differently uh, at the community level because I get caught up in the other work that I do um, regionally and provincially and it's very focused on like the water that's in a tap or water that we find um, in a glass. So you really have to expand your idea of what um, water is. So I wanted to show this image because that's actually really matters to people. They actually thought I was an idiot because uh, like where did you get your water? So we're trying to get the historical context and that's why we do research, so your idiocy can be pointed out at the community level. And it's, uh, <coughs> and so we lived right by the water. Like literally, we would get up, like we got our water, like went down to the lake and got the water. That was part of one of the things I had to do um, growing up. But some people live kilometers away, like more inland. And they and they said, well, so where did you get your water? Imagining them trying to trudge through the snow, like right now, like in my community, it's like three to four feet of snow. And they just looked at me like I was an idiot, like just outside the ice and the snow just like right yeah. there and I went oh yeah yeah like <laughs> so um, but we weren't really managing for that it was all about the water and what's going to come from the tap it wasn't really about how people lived and how they uh, how they want to live so being a researcher in communities is very humbling so um, so again, this is just images. So this is actually looking out from where I live. Um, so we need water. And for us, it's how in the Anishinaabek tradition anyway, um, it would be one of the natural laws. Um, the UN figured this out in 210 with its resolution that everybody needs water to live. They said, well, Anishinaabek had that figured out a long time ago. So we, um, so we need water. There, it doesn't matter how rich or poor you are, everybody, um, everybody needs to have water. And that's how it's understood. Um, at the community level, and as far as I can tell, in reviewing international uh, water declarations from indigenous peoples, a lot of that same theme comes up. Um, so, so starting with ceremony this morning was, was important because that's one of the most important things that have come from the water work that we've been doing for over, that I've been doing, involved with, with Chiefs of Ontario for over two decades. It always starts with spirit, it starts with creation. So starting with ceremony and song um, was, was really important. So for us, a lot of it comes from the creation stories. Like it goes back that far, that thousands of years of where we came from um, and, our, uh, and our history. So I'm always reminded about that. It doesn't start with colonization, and when that happened, it started way long before that uh, in, in our stories. <clears throat> 
So in my community, uh, relationship to water was personal. So I could go down to the lake and go get water. It didn't matter, minus 40, break the ice, go get water. That's how we, that's how we got water. Um, now we can't do that through all kinds of reasons. Um, so even though we have the best water that gets tested, it's actually not, because that's like the water that's coming out of the tap, right, as opposed to the, 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 the water. Um, that the lake, Margarita Bay, or, or all the different names that we have for water. So for us, that relationship was personal. And I, I didn't really think about how important that was until uh, where I live, actually it happened again this winter, the, the, the lines froze, so then we had to get snow and ice to go get water. And I sent my son down a few years ago when this happened, gave him a pail and said, go get water. <clears throat> he comes up a few minutes later and, and uh, I'm like, well, where's the water? He goes, oh, there's ice on the lake. And I'm like, well, you have to break the ice to get the water. Um, it just, even though it's my son, one generation, like he doesn't have that same connection to the water. So that's already been broken in one generation because we can't drink it. Um, so, so this relationship to water gets disrupted through these, uh, through these other places. Uh, there's a duality to water, as I mentioned. It's, it's dangerous to actually, uh, because uh, water can take life as well if we're not respectful. It can do that. So, so we, didn't, we didn't go frolicking the water willy-nilly. Like there were protocols before you entered into the water. Um, and respecting water laws, we understood them. So water has its own laws. So Canada's generating laws around water, the province is doing that. But water actually has its own set of laws that it follows through natural law. So we understood that and respected that. And respected the water beings that live in the water. So we tend to focus again on the H2O, but in working with community, it's like way more than that uh, in terms of uh, the work that we do. I just wanted to show you images of water, so we're talking about water so you can actually see it. <laughs> So uh, what is water? So this is work by M.A. Kraft, and probably some of the smarty pants in the room could probably find her paper on this, because it was out of the University of Waterloo in 2018 in about 15 seconds through Google. But uh, she talked about how we have really different ideas about water is. So to answer that question around, what do I see as some of the core challenges? We understand water differently. Uh, we don't think about it the same way. So I'm not going to read this because you can do that, except for the baby maybe. But uh, uh, so she talks about, again, that spiritual law is the center of how we go about our relationships with water. And actually our legal traditions um, uh, recognize that. So I see a lot of the, the conflict actually as a conflict of laws. So that's the work Lydia does, is trying to like reconcile that in, in what she's doing. The nature of water, again, not going to read this quote. So again, like we have to actually get to the question of what are we actually talking about, even when we're using these words? Are we even meaning the same thing um, in talking about water? And I'm looking at that clock. So I just, I wanted to, to give an example. So how we understand water. So this is my uh, shots of my family. So we do our sugar bush, which is about this time, except the snow is really deep to get in there. and. Uh, so that's the sap, and that's really important to us. To us, that's a, that's a really important water, because for the Anishinaabek, at this time of year, we'd be dealing with major food security issues. It's really hard to hunt. The snow is really hard to kind of maneuver at this time of year. And so this would come, and it was a gift from the trees when we really needed it, so it saved us many times. Um, it, uh, it, it, so water is considered a gift in this context. So sap water, when it comes from the trees, has a lot of minerals and it. it's very, it's actually considered a medicine. A lot of people use it for medicine at this time of year. So we think about, again, water very differently. This also happens at the time of year that ice is breaking. So there's a rebirth, there's life coming, and that again symbolizes women's water breaking when life comes. So it's all kind of connected in these different ways. So we have to think about water um, differently. Again, we think about water as uh, a gift that we receive, we don't take it, uh, not without permission. Uh, water is always in relation to other things. So for us, we have the four elements. So we don't even think about water in isolation. We think about it in relation to everything else that water is related to, because water is related to other things, uh, not just us. Um, what is water in the Anishinaabek tradition? Uh, water from the sky, so the rain. Uh, water on the land, which we typically think of, where we're getting our, our source water for drinking, women's water. So that's considered like an important water. So how do you make laws and try to govern that? Uh, and we're water, so tears, sweat, blood. So when it, that question, like, how do we relate to water? Go, well, it's like you're relating to yourself as well, right? So even understanding what water is is, is different. So how we, the laws and the governance that we would have around, around these uh, ideas around water are gonna look very different than um, the state ideas. 
Water also collects knowledge, but humans aren't the only entities that generate knowledge. But I can freak you out about that another time. <laughs> so some of the, the challenges, I see some of the challenges um, legal and political because we had our own. Like Lydia pointed out, we did. And so you, that authority uh, and jurisdiction uh, and legal relationship has to be recognized, which is based in spirit. And again, that kind of freaks out a lot of engineers. Um, federal provincial regimes are failing all the time, certainly failing indigenous peoples. I see historical ongoing colonialism as being a big part of that problem. There's a conflict of legal orders, a lack of respect for traditional knowledge. A lot of communities are living in the third world conditions because of that. It's not, it wasn't like that before. Um, the reason why that's sort of, I'm focusing on that a little bit is I was on a panel where people say, we're living in these third world conditions where we can't get water from the tap. And, and I'm like, actually, I grew up where we could get water and I preferred that. And that's actually what a lot of people want to be able to do. Like getting water from the tap actually doesn't solve the water problem. Um, so, you know, and that, that's because of colonialism. It wasn't like people signed up for that. Um, so undermining of indigenous jurisdiction and our severed relationship with waters. Even that example that I gave of my son, even in one generation that's changed dramatically. Even how I related to water was different than my grandparents because I grew up in the Great Lakes where they said, don't eat the fish. If you're a woman of childbearing age, you can only eat two. And it's like central to our identity. So that was different even than the generation before me. So it's, the impact has been quite uh, dramatic. Uh, so this is a... As part, when we were doing our source water protection plan, our water security plan, part of it was trying to revitalize our own traditions and connections to water. So it wasn't also only the technical kind of things, it was also the cultural, the spiritual. So this is uh, taking the kids out from the daycare on a water walk and uh, uh, grandmother Josephine Mondaman was part of our work because she's actually not uh, from uh, too far from my community. Uh, and as Kathleen pointed out, it's also living up to our responsibilities, but rights also comes responsibilities. So this is actually a shot from Chiefs of Ontario uh, uh, Youth Elders Gathering on water. Uh, we actually have to be on the land and waters in order to have a relationship with it. Hard to have a relationship with water in a cup, but you can. You can. Uh, and thank you. Miigwech. Thank you. Thank you, Deb, for sharing all those images of water in all its forms and all of its places. Our, our fourth panelist is, is Kelsey Leonard. Kelsey is from the Shinne, uh, Shinnecock Nation. She's a PhD student at McMaster University in political science, and she also has the distinction of being the fellow, Philomathia Water Policy Fellow. So welcome to the panel, Kelsey. Uh, Tabutni, thank you. Akwe uh, wanika sa kasilana nui swang shinakak nadoche tabunamish hod nashoni tabushmish nishnabek. So hello everyone. I greeted you in my language. I'm from the Shinnecock Nation. Um, our territory is located on the southern shores of what we call Pominock. Um, you may know it currently today as Long Island, New York. Uh, I also wanted to give thanks to the uh, Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee as well as neutral peoples for allowing me to, to be here today to speak to you and to, to share in, in conversation. Um, I'm a visitor to this land, so it's, uh, it's definitely a great honor and a pleasure for, for me to be here and to share a bit about um, my nation and, and where we come from and sort of how I find myself uh, now in, in the Great Lakes region. So as I mentioned, uh, we are a coastal Algonquin people. Um, so we uh, have distant relatives uh, with the, the Mi'kmaq and Maliseed. And um, some of you may be familiar with, with Pequot and Wampanoag, the, the folks that um, you may know, sort of know as the historical story of meeting the pilgrims. Um, we are seen as a, as a first contact people. Um, our first contact with uh, Europeans was in 1609 with the Dutch, um, but we still exist on our original territory um, on Pominock, uh, although in much more diminished uh, than it was in the 1600s. So uh, that's really important to understand that we've been dealing with over 400 years of colonization in terms of what our water story looks like. Uh, with that, currently today, um, we are not, I think when people hear of Long Island, they think of like, you know, and excuse anyone that this offends, but like the, the Guidos or sort of the, the, the Italian stereotypes of, of Long Island and or uh, the Hamptonites, which is actually uh, the villages that border where our um, reserve, what we call reservation or territory is on Long Island. Um, that's 
so unfortunate for you because you actually get to miss this whole storied history of what our land has looked like over the past 400 years and what it looks like today. Um, there are um, 13 original nations to the island, um, two with existing territories, um, both of which I'm descended from but enrolled in um, an active political citizen in Shinnecock. And when we're thinking about you know, water issues, the stereotypes that you have of that part of the world really do inform some of the challenges that we're facing. So um, not so much on the eastern end where our territory is. Um, a lot of people have those stereotypes in mind, but it's actually um, it's a lot of farmland, um, a lot of you know very wealthy, um, uh, what we sometimes like to call New York Cityites that come out into uh, onto the eastern portion of the island uh, just for their vacation homes. Um, but closer in, as we what we call going um, west instead of east, going towards New York City, we have some of the counties within the US that have the highest density population areas in all of the country. Um, and then New York City. Um, and we sit on top of one of the most pristine aquifers in the world. Um, that hasn't been tapped into directly by New York City yet, but it's still a lingering threat. That when New York City loses their access to potable water, to their access to a level of infrastructure of water security, that they will then tap into that aquifer diminishing um, our already and sort of exacerbating our already existing challenges related to water security as indigenous peoples on the island. Um, some of those existing security issues, uh, well, climate change for one, if anyone has heard about Superstorm Stan Sandy, um, that was a big issue in terms of uh, flooding, uh, saltwater intrusion. Uh, so the way that we get our waters on Long Island um, is predominantly from groundwater systems. Uh, piped infrastructure, it exists, um, but and, and, and sort of piped city systems or, or sort of more larger uh, uh, water systems, um, they exist, but they're, they're not as prevalent as groundwater well systems. In addition to that, uh, there's two sides to the water equation. Um, there's the water you drink, and then there's the wastewater. Where does it go? Um, on Long Island, we have cesspools. Um, there's places around here, too, that you have that as well. Um, but we have probably the highest concentration of cesspools um, in such a small amount of space uh, compared to other parts of the world. So that leads us to having major issues with um, nitrogen pollution um, and impacting our groundwater systems and sort of you know where your wastewater starts to mix with your fresh water. Um, those are massive challenges when we think about how climate change impacts that, superstorms impact uh, those issues, um, erosion because of those superstorms. So we sort of see diminished land base. We see uh, former areas for groundwater um, not being previously accessible. Then you add on to that. <laughs> Increased population, uh, we're still developing. People still want their vacation home in the Hamptons. Um, golf courses, that's another big one. Everyone loves to be able to have their pristine green golf courses. Um, it takes a lot of water to do that. Um, and it puts a lot of stress on the system. Uh, and for us as indigenous peoples, all of that has really impacted the way that we are able to conduct our, our ceremonies, um, engage with our spiritual citizenship, um, be able to uh, continue in the way that we have for millennia. And we're struggling to have our authority um, not only recognized, but valued in interjurisdictional systems. And I think really that's a part of what I do in, in my work now, um, both as an advocate for my nation and as a scholar, is to think about how do we work together and privilege indigenous voices alongside non-indigenous voices so that we can create a shared sustainable path forward and have that shared sustainable future. Uh, because ultimately, if we didn't want that, we would have kicked you out you know, 400 years ago in the 1600s. But that's not a part of our philosophy, our worldview, or our legal systems. Our legal systems are grounded in peaceful coexistence. But now, as Deb and others have mentioned, we're just, just sort of caught in these, this conflict of, of laws and conflict of worldviews that we really haven't been able to, to get out of. Um, so I'll, pa I'll stop there. I think that's, that's, that's enough for now in terms of what we're facing. Um, but I look forward to answering more questions. Thank you. Tabutni. Thank you for reminding us also about how complex water issues are from a political, a social, a cultural perspective, but also from a, a, a natural perspective in terms of storms and climate change. I know these are themes that the Water Institute is interested in as well. I'm going to let the audience ask questions in a moment, but 
I'm going to ask you the big question that I think is kind of like the elephant in the room. We have the TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Is it helping us to address water justice issues in this country yet? I'm not sure if anybody is able to sort of to tackle that one. Well, you've got to read it and know what the recommendations are and be prepared to act on them without question. I think it's created at least a framework where we can actually all say we can have a role in responsibility with respect to reconciliation as opposed to there's some one-sided exercise. Whose side is it? It's a collective exercise. So I think to the end that there are actual recommendations that people, if you get a hold of them, people ask me this, well, what can we do? And I say, well, look at the recommendations. Pick one. Act. That's fair. That's yeah. fair. Good. Yeah. I think that, uh, well, the, there's really broad reachings, call to actions in there, one of them being implementation of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, which, which covers everything. I remember getting this question, right? I didn't see anything on land use planning. And I'm like, what? Like, read the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. It's like all about land and waters and, and, and resources. I, th I think what it's done, it's been a catalyst. Um, and uh, so people are doing a lot more, um, seeing this in, uh, across the board in a lot of different institutions. But what I find is they tend to be doing a lot more of the same thing as opposed to transformative things that it actually call for. Like it actually call for a transformation um, of the relationship. And I, I'm for, the universities are guilty of this too. I just go, you're just doing more of the same thing. You're actually not transforming how you go about doing things. And that's actually what TRC called for. Um, one part of it that I, that I paid a lot of attention to is so when, when, they were, when the commission was established and they were doing their work, they had an elders and traditional knowledge, um, I guess, committee or advisory group. And, and what the elders there said was, you're not going to achieve political reconciliation until we reconcile that relationship with the earth itself. And so you have to, and you do that through indigenous laws and jurisdiction and governance, like how we did that. Um, so that, because almost every commission, Iprawash, Royal Commission said, that's almost like a core of a lot of the problems. So until we reconcile that as people to the earth itself, to the, to the land, to the natural world, we're always going to have um, these other challenges. So I think, you know, in some places it's kind of been taken up, but it's so focused just on people. And if there's anything about, to understand about the indigenous worldview, not that I speak for all indigenous peoples in the world, because I don't, Anishinaabe anyway, is that it always goes beyond people, always. And that's one of the things I said about reconcil reconciliation, it always goes beyond the human dimension. So we have to think a lot broader than that. So it's, it's called people to do that, and it's called for transformation. So we still have to, tackle that transformative part as opposed to let's just do more of the same, which clearly is not working. So we need to do things quite differently. Yeah. So that's. And that is the big challenge. Yeah. yeah. But thank you for sharing that. Should we go to the audience and ask uh, people for questions? Yes, um, please. I, ha I have a question. Yes, it's her question. Um, <laughs> how many people in this room have read the Truth and Reconciliation Act? If you just show your hand. Be honest. And I think that's really interesting because we're all here to listen to you, and one of the things that we could do is just read it, right, and act. And so I think if we could all go home and just try and read it, if you haven't. Maybe we could ask for a second show of hands, and who will commit to going home to read it? <laughs> you can get it online. Fantastic, there we go, that's progress. Little by little, all right. Thank you, all right, please, yes. Yeah. So what is your ideas on how to inspire and motivate people to take action on the things that you have said and the things that are already developed? How can we motivate the masses to like start taking action and how can we make them aware on a nice way, not on a way that they will feel judged or attacked? Any ideas? Well, I know one of the things that's really driven in the couch in Valley driven people together is this of crisis, right? Do we have to get to the point of drought and flooding before we actually look around and say, okay, the water is going to go where the water goes. And if we don't work together, um, there's, there's just a complete lack of understanding. So I think the idea of being able to at least uh, 
um, look around in your community and recognize where there is crisis because we're not without crisis in this country with respect to water. And if that can't motivate you, because as long as you're comfortable and you turn the tap on and it's all good, you might not be so motivated. But you're thinking about where is the crisis is part of what's happening in this country and we're, as Canadians, as citizens, should be thinking and having that, that, that real commitment and opportunity to take a step without being prodded. Yeah, so um, I think it starts at home. And for those of us who, who have children, um, you know, educate your children. Um, have that conversation with your children or with your colleagues in your workplace, whether you're in school. I go into my children's classrooms and we have that conversation about water. Where does your water come from? Know what your source is and know how to protect that source and get involved. I think what I would add to that, because it's World Water Day, so first of all, you're here, which is great, and listening listening to us, that you know, probably wasn't happening not that long ago, especially listening to Indigenous women. Um, so one of the, one of the things that, um, so I would say participate in things that, that people have already said. So uh, different communities are doing things, Six Nations, uh, Toronto what Water Allies, a water walk, just getting people involved, like that's actually what water looks like. It's not just coming out of the tap and in our water bottle and out of those refill stations. So people get, get more of a sense of like the real kind of embodied way of relating to water, I think has to happen. So it's like getting outside and having, trying to, trying to reconnect. Um, and also to remind yourself what it's like not to have it. So one of the things that uh, on World Water Day that uh, uh, grandmother Josephine Mondaman used to say was, um, take the day and not drink water because we're always taking all the time. What does it kind of feel like to like not have it, like to be thirsty and to not have access? So she used to, like we did that traditionally through ceremony and fast and it was a reminder because you wouldn't take for four days uh, depending on the, the, the fast and the ceremony so that we'd always be reminded about what it's like to keep taking and what it's like to not have it. So even in a very privileged place like Canada for a lot of people, but not all, um, then you would learn the importance of water. Then you would learn why you need to think about it. Um, so even, and like anybody could, I, you know, couldn't, I wouldn't do it to the baby, but anyway, so, <laughs> um, so just things like that, that she remind us of like, what is it like not to have it? And then put yourself in that position. And then you have a better sense of what it's like for people who, who, who can't have water and can't access water. Okay, Kelsey, did you want to add something? We're past the spot. I think one of the key things I just um, second everything that's already been said, especially around around education, um, in terms of educating ourselves as a collective, it really one of the biggest issues and struggles that I have in some of the collaborative governance work that that we do is that um, people who get into positions of leadership in the United States and Canada are not educated about indigenous peoples, nationhoods, indigenous sovereignty, the rights of self-determination. Um, they sort of relegate us to either being stakeholders or special interest groups, or sometimes this like magical unicorn of a race or, a, or minority. Um, we're not that. We're citizens of nations with a political identity and sovereignty. And until that is fully realized and people understand the longevity of that political identity, identity, it's, um, it's going to continue to be a struggle for us to actually sit at the table collaboratively and create that shared path forward. Thank you. That's a powerful message for all of us, I think. Yeah, thank you. I, I, sorry, I just want to add one, one other thing we've done in the valley, in the Couch and Valley, is working with the local school districts. We've, in the interest of getting, changing people's thinking, not starting from adults, we actually have a grade four program um, in the local school districts. We've worked out to just do an actual segment on water and include indigenous knowledge in that. So working with the young people is, are at, in couch and we're doing it at the grade four level. Like people, everyone goes through a process of uh, working and, and getting some understanding of water in, in from that context of so building blocks from young people's minds. Okay, thank you. Maybe in, in that vein, I wonder if the other panelists uh, have examples of things where uh, it's a success story, it, it's a signal of progress, it's something more concrete. Do any of the others have, have examples that they might share? Few and far between. That's fair. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I think 
I mean, um, the water declaration, uh, this is a success. Um, I think that uh, there's a lot of um, education and awareness that has uh, come from this, not just um, among governments and um, uh, federal or provincial municipalities, but among Indigenous peoples as well. And um, kind of, um, I guess, a rebirth, if you would, um, on responsibilities uh, with respect to water, on culture, um, ceremonies, and um, and this, you know, we use this all the time in all the work that we do. Um, it reminds us of our elders. It reminds us uh, of who we are as Indigenous peoples. So I would say that this is a success. Okay, thank you. I agree. And uh, just to approach the question from different scales, to be honest, when, when that question was posed in our prep for this, I had to sit there for a moment and go, um, like, uh, oh, uh, yeah, hard. But then, you know, I did, I did, when you think about it in a different way. So when I, especially over time, so Kathleen has been at this for a really long time, like all of, all of us have. Actually, Kelsey's still really young. You really can't. So, <laughs> <laughs> but um, is, so when I think about that, the first conversations that we used to have around this, so like, like, let's say the AFN conferences or the Tech Corps, what we call Tech Corps, Ontario First Nations Technical Services Conferences, it was pretty well mostly men um, and generally very technically driven. And like that's what the agenda looked like. And now you have women like uh, talking about responsibilities and source water, like thinking about water in, in really different ways. And that's probably over the last decade. So even like internally and for like, this is like kind of a big deal um, to really kind of push back on the broader sort of push about how we should be like trying to solve this this crisis and, and, and prob problems that we have in relation to this. Same with even in, in the recent, Kathleen was there, I, I missed it because I had to do, I, I frequently double book myself, but anyway, so uh, triple book myself is uh, um, the AFN Water Summit or Symposium uh, about a month ago, I think it was, maybe less than a month ago. So really centering again more the voice of women because women in the Anishinaabek tradition, I don't want to speak for others, generally had the, the responsibility to, to speak for water. Um, and that's different than even 10 years ago, where I remember there was this panel of men, and Sue Chiblo and I and others were sitting there going, it really should be women doing that. And the first thing, and it was a panel of men, and the first thing that the man said was, it really should be kind of women up here doing this. So eventually it did a shift, like it did kind of shift, right? Um, but it took a while for that shift to happen, for more women to be involved. So to me, from my perspective, that's kind of a big deal. And then seeing a lot more youth. Like we've had a, a traditional knowledge sessions uh, for Canada, for Canada Ontario Agreement, Great Lakes. When I started this 20 years ago, it was only men. Um, now, like I think it's my, um, predominantly women now. So that's like a really huge change. So you get a different conversation, you get a different narrative, you get a different you know, set of responsibilities being talked about. A lot of the focus used to be on rights, and it still has to be, because unfortunately they're still being violated all the time, basic human rights, you know, Aboriginal treaty, constitutionally protected rights, <clears throat> rights as we understand them. But now you hear people say, talk about rights and responsibilities, inherent rights and responsibilities. So that's part of the conversation now. So to me, that's, that's a big shift, because it means it's anybody can do that, as, whereas before it'd be, well, we'll leave that to the politicians and the advocacy groups to deal with the rights issues, but now it's like responsibility is like everybody's. So, so everyone can now contribute um, uh, and do something. So I think to me, those are, those are really big deals in terms of how the narrative has changed uh, and, and the role, the, you know, the emerging role of women. And, and as Kathleen pointed out, just understanding water in different ways is starting to happen more at the community and different levels. And I think, you know, Indigenous peoples have shown leadership and I think it's, maybe it's just the circles that I'm in, it's starting to show up in other people's radars. And that's a big difference. Like, that's a huge difference. Um, and then support for that. Um, but in terms of specific um, examples, I. I, I can think of um, one specifically with Rainy River, because again, I had to really think about this. So, so they were doing a lot of watershed work, like restoration around, um, around watersheds. So really working with um, local people, uh, 
farmers up in that area, so Rainy River is up in northwestern Ontario. So they did that over a number of years. Um, and so that required a fair degree of collaboration with, with others to do that. And they were able to restore and they were able to, um, to work on improving water quality as opposed to just this damage control, right? Like that's the mode we're often in a lot. So they're actually restoring and um, moving along in that kind of direction. So they were doing, um, uh, doing a lot of that work. And then I think of today, so some of the work of Water Allies, um, for the water walk, anybody can go, anybody can start learning, people can start uh, participating, starting to actually feel like what it's like to kind of be around water. Um, this is kind of where it's coming from. This is what it does at this time of year. So, so actually learning from water itself. Um, so I think those alliances are starting to be uh, starting to be built, um, but those it has to be indigenous peoples taking the leadership and allies saying, "Okay, what do you need? What can we do to help?" As opposed to saying, "Oh, I understand your problem, and this is what I think the solution is." Hasn't worked out that well for us uh, as uh, indigenous peoples. So, uh, so those are that's the way I sort of thought about answering that question. But it was it took me aback at first, and I'm like, "Geez, you know, like what has changed?" But over time, when you think over 10 or 20 years, it actually has changed quite a bit in terms of how we talk about this in this declaration um, reflects that and it's kind of like our marching orders forward in terms of the advocacy work that Kathleen and, and others do. So hopefully that was what you wanted or needed and that was helpful. Kelsey, did you want to add something? Yeah. Just one moment. Yeah, just one moment. We'll have this response and then we'll come to you for a question, okay? Yeah, I think one of the, the things that everyone has noted is or that I just wanted to highlight from what everyone has noted is that these developments, the change in women's representation, it wasn't just like, oh, for the past you know 100 years, women didn't want to have that seat, right? These were actually, these are the, these are the, the symptoms of colonialism that are, that are replicating in our systems. Um, so the fact that if you look at the original Indian Act, only men of 21 years of age could hold office or vote. So we were purposely excluded from, we had our franchise rights stripped of us. Um, and even if we didn't sort of necessarily have franchise rights in the way sort of Westphalian systems think of them, um, we had other political and legal ways of organizing that were taken from us. So when we think about, you know, what are our successes, I mean, it's kind of like asking the, you know, what, what are the successes of the U.S. in the past 100 years related to water? That's a, that's a big question to, to, to answer. So, but there are successes, I guess, is, is, the, is the short answer. There are so many because there are over 600 First Nations, you know, on the Canadian side, over another 600 uh, tribal nations on the U.S. side, and then multiple Indigenous communities and nations that are not recognized by Canada or the United States. So we get into nations, uh, you know, in sort of the proliferation of the thousands that all are working to protect their water because water is life. I think that is generally a commonality that is shared amongst us, but the way in which it is enacted is is very is very different. Um, and but there are successes, and I think you know one of the things that has really brought us together in recent years is the the passage of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in 2007. Um, that can and has been a very formative and grounding declaration in sharing our our shared struggles, but also our shared successes. Okay, thank you. I have two questions, one here and then I've got Larry and then I think um, we might be, if I have time I'm going to come back to you but we are also going to be wrapping up uh, fairly shortly. So let's deal with these two and then we'll see if we have time for a third one at the back. Okay, please. I had a point, uh, question regarding, oh, thank you. <coughs> uh, I got a question regarding uh, data gathering um, because a lot of topics, you know, this is covered by Lydia, the one from Cowichan there. Um, you touched on that, uh, the BC government has Many of you are familiar, uh, the Gordon Campbell Christie Clark era made major cutbacks to BC forests, BC environment, and that resulted in major cutbacks to data gathering in terms of groundwater, surface water, water quality, water quantity, and so on and so forth. And uh, especially in physically complex physiography, uh, very complex groundwater surface water interactions in BC with the mountains and the terrain, plus often sparsely distributed. Uh, areas and a lot of mining and resource extraction going on. There's a lot of lack of data gathering going on and the problem is we don't know what's out there. So we have, there's maybe a half a dozen water scientists in BC. There should easily be twice as many. That's in the BC government. And the problem is we don't have enough data being gathered. There's basically no technicians gathering data. That data is critical to making decisions regarding drought and flooding. 
And it's could, not just the... Could I get you to ask a question? Yeah, just well, that's the question. That's the background. So yeah. what do you think about doing that in the future? Do you want to be involved in that? Do you have people who can be hired for that position? It would be really good if we could have that because you people live on those remote areas. And if you could gather data, then you could also use that information in getting us in bolstering the case and how to manage the water better when right. crises happen. All right, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you uh, for the question. It's critical, right, in terms of you have these little pockets of data that get uh, that never get aggregated to give you the full story. Part of the one of the successes of creating the Couch and Watershed Board, and this is something I did like over a decade ago. I just reached out to the regional district chair and said, "Look, we're not making collective decisions or aggregating data or even collecting data necessarily that's going to help us make the most informed decisions we can." And so when we created the Couch and Watershed Board, um, part of that was um, um, the, the science and traditional knowledge aspect. So we created research, little um, committees that would incorporate both traditional knowledge and science and uh, started to get resources to start aggregating our own data. And then so once we start to aggregate data, you know, where our youth are going out and testing, we're engaging and they're connecting with water, but also bringing, so I mean, there's, there's you get this, this development of a database, but it has to be connected to um, other data that's available so we can get that aggregate and get a good understanding of the best, uh, whether it's policy or governance decisions we make in support of sustainability. So we're do where it starts definitely what we've been doing is start, starting to aggregate our own um, data, but also tapping into the uh, uh, the provincial government and really working with them around uh, the particularly this work around the environmental assessment act. One of the key things that everybody is very concerned about is we don't, we have all this process we go through, but there isn't an aggregate of the impact of water on water um, in, uh, in British Columbia. So that's very, a lot of discussion about that. How do we make those linkages? How do we start to trust each other with our data? You know, is part of the challenge that we have. So that's part of the work we've been doing is saying, look, we're all reliant in the Cowichan Valley, in this particular Cowichan Watershed Project, we're all reliant for our sustainability. We're all human beings reliant, so let's start there and, uh, and start collecting our own data and then advocating for the development of the larger database that supports the decision making and also getting out there and doing the testing and getting the data. Okay, I'm gonna have time for a very quick question from Larry and yep. then uh, we're gonna get into closing because I know some of our students have classes at 11.30, so. Right, uh, thanks very much. I, uh, I, as a quick preface to this point, uh, the I think too often indigenous water issues gets reduced to potable water questions. And as it's like, you, you know, you lag behind, you don't have enough and so on. Whereas actually, you know, most of our water is in our food and it's therefore it's about land. And the absence of potable water uh, for drinking and household is very small water. It's, so it's not a scarcity issue. It's a political question. If you don't have it, it's about politics, and since we have legal and political minds up here, uh, this is the International Water Decade, 2018 to 2028. Uh, there's a water alliance. I think we have to build alliances. Larry, I need you know, to ask a question. It's coming, it's coming, Gene. It's gotta come now fast. The question okay, is, yeah. you know, it, oh, I'm talking about political strategy. So, you know, what is a point of entry that we could all get, could we rally around? So, for all example, right, in Canada, right, could we good. rally, right, well, could we what? rally around the Canadian Water Act and its updating, for example? All right. Well, I'll, I'll start as my co-panelists think, think about the question. Um, firstly, I was starting to see all of these um, notations about excitement for World Water Day around Indigenous peoples circulating on social media over the course of the week. And they constantly was saying Indigenous peoples lag behind in access to water security or, or potable water. Um, so thank you so much for using that phrasing because it allows me to bring it up. If you look up the definition of lag, it means to fall behind in movement or development. See, that actually places the agency or the responsibility of falling behind onto indigenous peoples. When the reality is that colonialism, both past and present, ongoing acts of colonialism, have stripped us of our agency. 
So we're not lagging behind on anything. We have been purposefully and systematically excluded from the processes of water management in this country and other countries around the world. And so until sort of white settler modes of water management decide to recognize indigenous systems of water decision making and co-manage together, we're not going to see any real political legal changes that manifest a shared sustainable future. So for me, it's to say settlers need to acknowledge their past and current wrongdoings before we can even attempt at any form of decolonization. Okay. I am going to, yeah, th thank you. Um, the last comment? No. I, 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 I've been asked to wrap it up. Oh. So I'm, can, can, uh, I, think I, I think I should uh, play the role of the chair. That's what they asked me to do. And I'm going to ask Bernie Dunker to come up and uh, just close our session quickly. Uh, Bernie is the Associate Vice President of Research at the University of Waterloo. Well, wow, what a, a fantastic session. I think you've given us so much to think about in terms of uh, the discussion today to inspire us all to work towards more success stories in the future. Um, on behalf of the University of Waterloo, the Office of Research, and the Water Institute, I'd like to sincerely thank the panelists for your informative and important uh, perspectives and to thank uh, Dr. Jean Andre for doing a fantastic job of moderating the panel this morning. Um, yeah, thanks. It's important for us to step back and think and, and analyze and to examine how it is that a country like Canada uh, can fail to provide safe drinking water for all. Uh, we've learned about the complexity of this issue at this morning's panel, and I'm sure all the audience members are going to uh, go away with um, a lot of ideas and motivation about how we can all work towards a day when there is safe drinking water for all in this country. Uh, we have a small gift to thank the panelists for joining us today. Uh, we'll be offering you um, tobacco with respect and gratitude for sharing uh, your time and experience with us today. So thank you very much to the Water Institute for organizing this great session and this whole World Water Day celebration at the University of Waterloo. Uh, the Water Institute is a fantastic example of a forum where interdisciplinary research and education comes to the fore. At the University of Waterloo, we recognize it's very important to tackle problems and the big questions of the day from different angles. And I think this World Water Day celebration at the University of Waterloo uh, really exemplifies how we're able to do this. Uh, we very much support strong disciplinary research at the University of Waterloo, but we also feel it's very important to support vigorous interdisciplinary research. Uh, so I'll just wrap up by uh, thanking the panelists again. Thank you all for attending this session. And I'd like to remind everyone that we do have a full day of events and exhibits that we invite you to explore. So just quickly, uh, be sure to visit the poster session and career fair in the atrium to learn more about the great breadth of water-related research happening at Waterloo. This is happening all afternoon. Student lightning talks will be taking place from 1 to 2 p.m. in this very room. Please visit the exhibits and booths of our stakeholders and sponsors uh, in the atrium. And I would like to extend a special thanks to our level two sponsors who have helped to make this event possible. Golder Associates, 
Matrix Solutions, and the Walkerton Clean Water Center. And of course, former Premier Bob Ray is going to be giving a talk upstairs in room 1012 at 3 p.m. Craig Norris from the CBC will be moderating. At this point, we invite you all to join us for a vegetarian lunch that will be served upstairs in the atrium. Thank you again. Thank you.